First, uh, again, like Sernan said, welcome everybody uh, from wherever part of the world you're from. I know uh, some of you, it's early morning and some of you, it's later in the day. So I uh, most definitely appreciate you taking time out to uh, join us today for this presentation. And hopefully um, we make it uh, worth your while and, and informative and uh, share with you some uh, information and because there's so much testing that's taking place. I mean, and we're learning more almost daily on uh, tests and reports that uh, people are sharing with us from all over the world, actually, on testing that's been done. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, I was a career firefighter. Uh, I spent, uh, well, with up to present, I've got over 30 years in the fire service. Um, I retired back in 2011. Um, I had trained through my years of service up to a, a hazmat specialist and uh, tried to learn as much about uh, dealing with some of the high hazard fires that uh, firefighters are called and faced with on a daily basis. So uh, when I retired, I was hoping to share things that I learned. And when I would uh, work with uh, departments and industry and setting up tabletop drills and different exercises, um, many of the chiefs would pull me aside and ask me if I was in charge of a scene, um, how I would deal with it. And in many cases, uh, my response to the chief was protect your exposures and let it burn. So um, considering it was the 21st century, I thought, you know, there has to be a product, there has to be something um, that can hopefully make uh, dealing with some of these high hazard fires a little bit easier, um, give us a little bit of a, uh, again, an advantage uh, and uh, be able to work on extinguishing these fires. So, it led me to uh, do a search and I stumbled across uh, hazard control technologies and the product that we're going to be talking about, the F500 encapsulator agent. Um, so I want to start and give you a little bit of the background because like myself, when I retired, my mission was hopefully to make firefighting a little bit safer. And as you can see, it's in our mission statement with hazard control technologies. You know, We want to be a leader in fire prevention, protection, and suppression. And the thing is, is we have a flooring free innovative encapsulator technology that I hope to uh, give you a better understanding of how it uh, works. Um, and we'll talk keying in on the lithium ion battery hazard, but you know, we'll be able to talk a little bit about how it deals with pretty much everyday fires as well. So as we go and we talk, one thing is that we are a global distribution company. We're based out of uh, Georgia, Fayetteville, Georgia to be exact. Um, the product has been around since 1997. So this isn't a product that has just come to the market because of, I guess you can say, some of the high hazard fires that are being you know, developed because of changing in technology. Um, this technology has been around for many years um, and it is fluorine free. Um, there is no PFOS in it. There's none of the PFOS and PFOAs. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the presentation. But I would just like to key in on that. You know, it is an eco-friendly solution. Now, today, I want to key this in and, and hopefully keep it uh, mostly about the lithium-ion batteries, the hazards, the things that uh, we have. We'll talk about some of the areas and the problems, and uh, it's a growing hazard, as we know. Let's, you know, look at, you know, all the different areas where we can find these batteries. It's it's not only in our homes and our cars, uh, but, you know, hey, it's business. It's general public. You know, we go anywhere we go. People have got their cell phones, e-cigarettes. Um, and now we're finding like e-scooters and mobility devices all around as far as the transportation, our cars. And in business and power with trying to be able to store energy and uh, be able to put it onto the grid without having to, let's say, buy um, power from other sources at high cost. Um, we're using it for energy storage, power shaving, and, and in healthcare and different construction. We look at how it's impacting our industry. We see uh, automotive, not only automotive, but we have like school buses, we have fleet. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the, the trucks and, and uh, delivery vehicles and things like that. So we've got the uh, lithium ion powered vehicles growing in use, uh, being uh, many times in, in fleets. Uh, we have them in industry, high lows, forklifts, uh, scissors lifts. 
Now, things that were one time using lead acid batteries or trying to go into your your lithium ion batteries are looking for something that's a, a different technology because it holds so much power. And so because of that, these batteries comes in, in all different sh shapes and sizes based upon their use, what they're being used in. Um, the voltage can vary because of the amount of power the device might need to be able to operate for extended periods of time. So we have different things in different ways that uh, these batteries can be sandwiched into some of these uh, devices. And they come in different uh, forms. They come in the polymer pouch or the envelope style battery, uh, the cylindrical and the prismatic style batteries. So as we talk about the different battery types, you know, we also then need to look at, you know, the chemistry behind some of these batteries and how they're made. And, you know, some of the probably the most common one are the lithium ion phosphate or the nickel, uh, the lithium nickel magnesium cobalt oxide or the lithium uh, nickel cobalt aluminum. So probably some of the more common ones. And again, based upon what they're being used for is going to generally dictate the, the chemistry because some of the chemistry might be um, better suited for an energy storage system, but very poor for a, a mobility device. Um, so these chemistries kind of go along with uh, the type of device they're going to be used in. Now, when we sit there and we start following in the news, we keep hearing about all these different failures, these batteries occurring on the highway, in our homes, and our businesses, um, battery energy storage systems that I mentioned, and, you know, hey, sometimes in our warehouses, um, when there are batteries in the process of being shipped, uh, we can have instances where these batteries fail. And, you know, we need to ask, are you prepared? You know, how are you going to deal with them? I know there's many people out there that um, have different opinions. So hopefully as I go through, um, we can hopefully help guide and give you some ideas and how uh, basically the F500 and the encapsulated technologies can, can work and be able to help not only your team, but your facility with fixed systems, sprinkler systems, and being able to work in, in engineered systems. Um, same with industry, how we can work and help you with designed systems that can be installed in even existing uh, systems that we'll talk about. And, you know, in the news, not long ago uh, in the UK, you know, here we had a parking structure leading to a collapse. Uh, and if you're familiar with, with the way, even just your internal combustion engines, if cars and vehicles burn, if you have them all parked close together and one catches fire, you know, the heat is going to propagate. And when you sit there and you start watching the videos with these electric vehicles, the jetting flames, um, that is just, in many cases, uh, amplified and magnified. And, you know, that heat transfer is even worse. So when we sit there and we start looking and ask the question, you know, what causes or, or what can start these fires in the first place and when we sit there and we you know again think about it a, a short circuit overcharging you know dropping it uh, basically we've seen and heard of people you know on uh in their vehicles putting your cell phone on the dash and the sun um you know hitting down on it and heating that cell phone up uh, i know i've done it and kind of grab my phone and you look at your phone and it, it basically tells you that, uh, hey, it's it's overheated and it won't work. Um, it's got to cool down. So we, we probably all have maybe experienced that. Uh, and we know that that type of an incident, if it wasn't caught in time, could lead to a battery failure. And again, you know, a trauma with a vehicle, an accident. Um, and again, sometimes there's in the manufacturing process, we know here not what a few years ago with the Samsung phones, um, they had the, a serious issue because there was some short circuiting that was taking place because of some uh, issues with the manufacturing process that led to some serious fires with their, the, some of the phones since been corrected but again in in the process it's something that we need to understand and we need to be concerned about so as we start to talk about how they fail we start to hear the term thermal runaway um we have to understand when we're talking about thermal runaway we're talking about an individual cell 
Um, that cell fails, it heats up. Then what happens is it passes the heat to the batteries around it, next to it, and we start to get into what's called that thermal propagation, uh, thermal runaway propagation, where it's starting to go from cell to cell and from maybe module or battery to battery. So, you know, it's, it's basically a, a quick developing chain reaction um, where it's going from one individual cell to many cells. And when they burn, you know, we see that and we hear about all the toxic gases that are being emitted. And, and from all the different videos, we can even see it, especially as I get in a little further, we'll show some, some videos of how these will start to give off that uh, heavy gas. And, and then we start to see the flames as they start to um, catch on fire, start going into the thermal runaway. And we're going to talk more about that as I go through the presentation. When we look at the construction, um, depending again on the uh, different types of construction or, or the different types of chemistries of the batteries. But, you know, in most cases we have uh, layered components, plastics and materials, and then we have electrolytes. And um, these batteries will come in many different shapes and sizes. Again, you know, the chemistry and the, and the industry is trying to develop new batteries and new chemistries and new technologies so that they can find a battery that can hold even more power. Uh, hold more energy and be able to get cars to uh, travel a further distance or trucks, uh, whatever devices um, that they may be used in. You know, we're trying to be able to rapidly charge um, and then discharge these batteries and hopefully they can get us, you know, further distances and, and be able to charge them up quickly. So when we sit there and start looking at, you know, our energized environment and, you know, we look at these batteries and the amount of energy based upon the weight and things like that, you know, we also need to know and understand that, that explosive potential because of the electrolytes that are stored inside. And we see that in, a, in many of the videos where when a lithium ion battery fails, we have those jetting flames. And we'll see some of that as, as we go through the presentation. So we want to talk a little bit when we sit here and we do this as far as, you know, fire suppression, because there's so many different opinions on how we should deal with uh, these types of fires, these types of incidences. And that's where we asked, you know, what's your current choice of dealing with a lithium ion fire? Um, is it plain water? Is it foam? Is it CO2 or some other clean agent? Um, there's, there's many opinions on, on how these should be dealt with and so hopefully you know well i'm not going to cover all of them we would like to talk about testing um, that's being done and is is you know even today uh, continues with the agent f500 so we know with plain water um and inerting gases one of the things with inerting gases is they're they're utilized uh, quite a bit in some of the older and some of the first uh, battery energy storage systems that uh, have been on the market. And if we think back uh, oh, a few years ago, I believe it was around 2017 in Surprise, Arizona, we had an incident dealing with a uh, battery energy storage system. They had a failure uh, leading to a fire. The inerting gas system activated to work to suppress the vapors, but Again, the inerting gas systems really do very little to remove the heat or to remove the toxic hazards and the gases that are being released with the batteries. So while we're we're making the atmosphere uh, where it's you know not able to have uh, flames anymore, um, we still have again a buildup, and all it's waiting for is the right air fuel mixture. And that's what happened in this particular instance. So the firefighters did exactly what they should have. They took their time. Um, they've got experts from the industry to come in and, and talk to them about the hazard. And they were doing their monitoring um, and they were taking their time. Uh, finally, after a few hours, a decision was made that we need to open this container up. And when they did, there was an explosion. Um, it uh, shot some firefighters uh, or through firefighters um, a great distance, about 60, 70 feet through a cyclone fence, injuring a um, few of them, uh, two were career ending. So, I mean, these systems uh, do lead to um, some hazardous conditions. And so uh, we need to understand 
the nature of the beast when we're dealing with with some of these older Connex box style battery energy storage systems. There's a lot of people um, that uh, are saying that water is the solution, copious amounts of water when we hear about it. The thing with water is, is when it is used, uh, we get the extinguishment, but then hours, days, possibly even weeks, we're reading in the news where these uh, vehicles or these batteries are reigniting. Um, again, causing a hazard, causing an issue wherever they may have been. And uh, we are now with our towing companies and with different uh Groups saying that, hey, if you have a damaged lithium ion battery, you know, it needs to be handled uh, specially. You know, we need to set it aside 50 feet away from other vehicles or, or other uh, buildings and so on. So there's some special precautions um, that we need to relay to people and make them understand when dealing with these types of hazards. And uh, I know there's people that uh, have the uh, impression uh, or the opinion of let it burn. Um but when you're starting and you're looking at a major busy highway during a rush hour time period, are you going to shut down a major highway for hours um, while you watch a car burn? Um, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of opinions, a lot of things. So hopefully as we continue on through this presentation, um, we can show you maybe some ideas and some technology that is going to work better. And let's understand, you know, when we use water, why we're having those reignitions take place. Because when we sit there, we look at the amount of water that's needed. Again, you know, it's copious amounts. And from watching news reports, you're hearing a car taking anywhere from 15,000 gallons or 30,000 gallons of water. Um, that Connex box, that battery energy storage system type, or even a building um, that might have a sprinkler system. Uh, running for in excess of a week to 10 days, uh, possibly two weeks, a million plus gallons of water. Um, in, in many areas of around the world, they're experiencing drought conditions. So when we look at one fire um, that is dealing with lithium ion batteries, do we really have that much spare water that we can just, you know, well, I, I'm going to say waste? and cause environmental issues because of the water runoff, the, the contaminants and the things that are in that water from the batteries that are burning. Do we have the, that amount of, 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 I guess you can say, disregard or that amount of extra water that we can just utilize? So when we look at it, you know, it is a poor uh, way to cool. It does very little. Again, I've talked about that reignition of the thermal runaway, the thermal propagation. The toxin reduction, very little. So overall, that water is not a uh, really, really uh, the best solution when dealing with these types of fires. So let's get in and talk a little bit now and hopefully give you a better understanding of the encapsulator agent, how it's going to be able to work, some of the testing that's been done, and some uh, different things that have taken place. Unfortunately, you know, we've got some testing that's taking place currently. Some really good results came from it. Um, the report hasn't been released yet. So hopefully in our next uh, PowerPoint or our next webinar on our lithium ion batteries, we'll be able to share that information. Um, it's, it's, it's really eye-opening as far as the effectiveness. So uh, we're going to continue on though, and we'll talk about uh, what we do have currently as far as testing. And that is the fact that the product has been tested to an EPA uh, standard. It's the EPA 537.1, which tests for 25 different fluorinated ingredients. Uh, the results are that there is no fluorinated ingredients of the 25 tested for, and that includes the PFOS and the PFOAs. So this is a fluorine-free, non-corrosive and biodegradable product, environmentally friendly. It's green, basically. Um, it is a CULUS and NFPA compliant fire prevention, protection, and suppression agent. And one area that I like to always point out when I'm doing uh, these demonstrations and trainings with fire departments and talking to them about the encapsulator technology is a combustible and flammable vapor and liquid spill mitigation agent. I like to highlight the vapor because what other toolbox or what other tool in the firefighter's toolbox is there 
that can eliminate a vapor and prevent a fire and explosion from occurring. I mean, we could use a water a water stream to kind of blow that and, and maybe hopefully not allow those gases to accumulate. But what do we have that can eliminate and prevent an explosion from occurring? And here we have it right here. And when we look at the NFPA 18A standard, right in the name of the standard, a water additive for vapor or for fire control and vapor mitigation. So even in the standard talks about being able to mitigate those vapor hazards. So as we go through and we start talking more about the encapsulator agent, how it is different than things that we're currently using as far as your foams and powders and things like that, is when we talk about foams, we're talking about bubbles. We're talking about a, a product or we're talking about a concentrate that's going to make these thin wall bubble structures and they're going to work on a mechanical basis to cause a separation between the fuel and the oxygen. Why don't they work on lithium ion batteries? Well, because lithium ion batteries are a three-dimensional fire. And if we go into the NFPA 11 standard and we look at Annex A11 of the standard, it states in there that foam is not suitable for a three-dimensional fire. Yet, we go into and we start looking at the NFPA 18A standard and we go into section 7.7, you'll see in this it is a spherical micelle and it's a spherical micelle stability test. So what's happening is we are not making a bubble. What we're doing is we're going into the water and we're chemically changing the makeup of a water droplet and then how that water droplet is able to cool, extinguish, and encapsulate toxins and, and hazards that would be in the smoke or in the uh, product as far as being able to reduce those toxicities. And I'm going to just highlight this a little bit. We're going to talk more about these, this anic Annex 4.3, but when we talk about the product, and again, going into 4.3, we look at uh, some independent third-party testing that talks about the ability of these agents to halt the thermal runaway and propagation. We'll see how it's able to encapsulate the explosive gases and corrosive electrolytes. And we'll talk more, and you'll see, again, in 4.3, just some of the different, uh, I guess, agencies that have been testing it. We're going to, as I continue on, talk about some reports that have been done, again, around the world, that talk about the ability of encapsulator agents to be able to rapidly reduce temperatures, be able to stop thermal runaway, stop thermal propagation. We'll see how it's able to encapsulate the flammable electrolytes. And once we've encapsulated those flammable electrolytes, they're not going to relight. Um, they're encapsulated. The hazard of flammability is gone. We look at the toxic reduction and how we're able to reduce the HF gas and the hydrogen. We're going to see how we're able to work on all aspects of a lithium-ion battery fire. You know, not just be able to put out some flames, but how we're able to deal with the gases, the liquids, all aspects of the fire. And when we sit there, we start getting in and we start talking more again about that 4.3 annex and the materials and people that have tested some of the chronology. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But overall, you know, there's a lot of third party testing that has been done and continues yet today, showing the effectiveness of encapsulator agent when it comes to dealing with these lithium ion battery fires. To help you understand um, that spherical micelle, uh, we need to sit there and need to understand how and what they are. So the basic building block of the encapsulator agent is that spherical micelle, as I said, and it starts with our molecule. A simplified version shows our polar head. The polar head loves water, wants everything to do and be in water. And the nonpolar tail, which fears water, will do anything it can to get out of the water. And for that reason, when you add the concentrate to the water, those tails, because they want to get away from the water, they automatically and instantly orient into these spherical micelles. Now, as, as they continue and they travel through our water line, our hose stream, whatever it might be, and it comes out of either a sprinkler head or a firefighter's uh, nozzle, those spherical micelles that are closest to the surface of the water droplet, they're going to break apart. Those tails are going to spin, spin out and they're going to put a surface on the uh droplet on each and every water droplet yet inside of each and every water droplet there are still millions and millions of these spherical micelles 
And just, just to kind of give you a visual uh, to help you understand how many of these spherical micelles are in the water droplet, if that water droplet was the size of the Earth, the spherical micelles inside of it would be about the size of a pea. So when we say that there's millions and millions of these spherical micelles in a droplet, you know, just to give you an idea, um, and again, they do serve a purpose and how it's able to rapidly cool and how it's able to have an effect on being able to encapsulate and deal with all the hazards that we have when we deal with these fires. So again, we're not talking about bubbles. We're talking about spherical micelles, the basic building block. And these work on all the different types of uh, chemicals that we're dealing with, the carbon molecules, hydrocarbon fuels, polar alcohols, nonpolar. Uh, it is able to encapsulate these flammable and combustible liquids. And once we've encapsulated them, um, they are no longer a combustible or flammable hazard. As long as we meet a formula, I'm not going to say, you know, I can put a little bit of this into a, a million gallon storage tank and I've ruined a million gallons. No, there's, there's, there's a, there is a formula um, and I'll uh, be happy to share it with you. It's the one part of F500, um, eight parts of, of water, uh, eight parts of fuel, 40 parts of water. So we need to understand that, uh, that formula and, um, uh, as long as we're staying within that, we get that total encapsulation and we're able to eliminate the flammable or combustible hazards of the fuels. As I continue on, again, I said that I was going to start to talk about some of the testing that's been done in, in a chronology. And as I get into it, I start talking more about, you know, the Annex 4.3 material. I'm going to bring up one group that uh, did some testing and it's probably the first group. Um, it's Bosch over in Germany. Uh, they were looking for a, a, a solution for dealing with the lithium ion battery hazards as, as they were getting and developing uh, and using that technology more and more. And they tested the powders, the foams, the gels, they tested, you know, different agents to see uh, what would best protect their facility. And when all of their testing was done, they standardized on the F500. And I kind of use the example of, you know, instead of having, if you were a, a, a company um, and you were trying to find a solution to deal with a, a hazard, um, would it be easier to sit there and, and hang, let's say, five different extinguishers on the wall? Let's say a red one for, you know, one type of fire and a, a blue one and a green one you know you have you know five or six different extinguishers that you need to train your employees on and say okay well you can only use this extinguisher for these types of fires and you need a different extinguisher if, if this is burning and and so on it, it can get maybe confusing well the reason why bosch standardized on it is because now you can hang one fire extinguisher on the wall and have one extinguisher that, that can deal with all classes of fires and that was pretty much their reasoning behind standardizing on the F500. It was an agent that could deal with all these different categories and all these different classifications of fires. And it was much easier to work and, and get your people trained on. So let's start getting into some of the testing that's been taking place around the world. You know, this is one that comes to us from Fraunhofer over in Germany. Again, it's highly uh uh, and instrumented and scientific behind it, what they're trying to accomplish. You know, we've got some thermal imaging that's taking place. We're looking at the heat uh, with, with that, uh, not only with the temperature sensors, and we're looking at the effectiveness of how the F500 can have an effect on stopping, again, the thermal runaway and propagation. So here we have, you know, the fire, the battery um, going into its runaway propagation. The F500 is activated and it rapidly extinguishes the fire. And as you can see from the thermal imaging and the temperature sensors, we have a great reduction in temperatures. Um, so we have stopped that thermal runaway and that thermal propagation. As we continue on and we look at some other events that have occurred, you know, we hear and we see these on the news. Uh, let's let's talk about you know all of the uh, bad uh, or all the press that we're getting out of New York and, and other areas of the country where you know these e-mobility devices and I like this one because 
you know, here's here's off to the left the doorway. Um, that is the exit out of the structure, possibly. Um, and and you know, here you have you know this device, depending on you know how soon it's caught, you know, this could be causing one exit out of the structure to be blocked. And as we know from the reports out of areas, you know, it's leading to injury and deaths. And I'd like to show this video because, again, here is one that we can show that deals with our factories. And I like to show this because when we sit there and we look around at our office buildings, our schools, our hospitals, our apartment buildings, um, we start looking around at all of these different areas where we have probably a very, very large number of lithium ion battery devices. What is the extinguisher that's required by our codes? Yet, as you're going to see, you know, and the employees in this factory are doing just that. You know, they've been trained to deal with these fires. So they're running around throughout this facility and they're grabbing these ABC extinguishers, the powder extinguishers, and they're going to come and they're going to start working to try to extinguish this fire so that they can get back to work. Um, I mean, hey, if, if, if they can't put this out and they're not unable to uh, get back to work, you know, that's, that's, that's their livelihood. That's how they're going to be paying their bills. So they're doing what they can, making every effort. And as we see here again, um, and we understand powders are, very poor when it comes to trying to deal with a lithium ion battery fire. Uh, great example. And, and again, when we sit there and we talk about, and we read about, you know, some of the actions that are being taken in some of our large cities where they're, instead of trying to find a solution, they're passing building codes or they're trying to pass rules or, you know, people are not allowed to bring the e-mobility <laughs> devices into the buildings or they're not able to work on them or charge them or so on. And, you know, if you're a father and you ever told one of your kids not to do anything, as you know, it's basically challenges on dad. Um, and, and, you know, what they're going to do what they can, maybe see that they can't uh, kind of break a rule here or there. And the same thing happens, but now here's the problem. If these people are bringing these e-mobility devices into buildings and there's been building codes that say, hey, you're not supposed to have them in there. Do you think if that battery then fails and catches on fire, they're going to dial 911 to get emergency services activated and on the way? No, because they weren't supposed to have that in there. They're going to get in trouble and they understand that. So they're going to do everything they can to try to extinguish this fire. We just see the powders don't work. So why instead aren't we looking at, and we'll talk about it a little bit more as I continue on, aren't we looking at an agent or an extinguisher that can deal with these types of fires and have an effect and being able to extinguish and reduce the hazards? So we've talked about how these encapsulation agents work, the F500, as far as the flammable vapors, and I mentioned it. So you know, let's see if we can't get in and, and hopefully give you a better understanding of, of how exactly they work with that hat, well, rapid heat reduction. We're able to take temperatures that are excess of 12, 1300 degrees and drop them down into that 100, 120 degree temperature range in seconds. Best of all, without creating a scalding steam. Um, there's no steam. So you do see a lot of white mist. It's a water vapor that's coming off of those, and we'll see some videos as we continue on where we'll point that out again, uh, but it is not steam. We talk about the thermal circuit and how it works. Uh, just to give you an idea, again, when we have those tails on the surface of the water droplet, those tails act like a heat sink, and what they're going to do is they're going to drive that heat interior to the water droplet. And those millions of spherical micelles that are inside the water drop that I talked about in the animation, they're rapidly going to absorb the heat and slowly release that heat into the water around them. And in that process of transferring the heat from those spherical micelles to the water around it, um, there is no steam that's being created. The water never hits 212 degrees. So instead of working by 
Uh, creating a steam, we're working by what we sh what we consider a thermal conveyance. We're conveying that heat. We're transferring that heat, um, and it's very very effective. With water, um, you know, water being again that poor conductor, we're using it. We're creating steam when we're using it for firefighting and we're using it for things. We're probably only using about three to five percent of that water droplet. That's why when you watch fire departments and you watch some of these fires. You see, you know, master streams, thousands and thousands of gallons of water flowing, and you're seeing thousands and thousands of gallons running away, running off the scene, going into the environment, going down sewers and streams, because it's such a poor um, conductor of heat. It's very poor at being able to reduce that heat and, and extinguishing uh, these fires. When we look at in this video, again, I point out, the white mist that you see is not steam. I also, on the very bottom right-hand corner, you're going to see there's uh, some temperatures. There's a thermal, uh, some thermal temperatures on here showing like 1190 degrees. Um, they're going to sit there and they're going to start hitting this this fire with a F500 solution, and you're going to see just how quickly they are dropping you know, from that 1100 degree range, you know, down to the 100 and, 100 and even below here in a second. Again, the white mist is not steam. Um, so the other thing you'll see from the temperature colors of the vehicle, just how quickly it changed, showing the reduction in heat as well. So the same effect that you're seeing there with a car fire, a vehicle fire, is the same thing you're going to have with a battery. The ability of this agent to draw that heat and remove the heat so that you're having an effect on being able to cool the battery and stopping that thermal propagation. We talk about, you know, the free radicals, the black smoke, and all the other toxins that are being released. And we're going to see how the encapsulator agents, those spherical micelles that are inside of the water droplet, as they are going and, you know, hitting these uh, toxins in the air, they're encapsulating uh, and they're reducing those and, and removing them from the atmosphere and improving the quality. And it comes to uh, this report that uh, was done by Clemson many years ago. And while toluene was the fuel source, what they did is they, they wanted, because they noticed, you know, black smoke was turning white and the question was asked why. Um, so this test was designed and developed to, see if we couldn't answer the question. And what they did, again, as I said, toluene was a fuel source, inverted glass funnel, looking for three things. Light transmission through the smoke column. They were looking at the buildup of soot on the walls of the inverted funnel, and then the toxicity of the soot. And they were using water to spray in through the smoke column, not trying to extinguish the fire, but just spraying through the smoke column, and then they ran the test using a 3% solution of the F500 um, through the smoke column. And the results were that they noticed 97% reduction in the soot, the toxicity of the soot. The toxic smoke was reduced by 98.6%, where all your carcinogens are, the toxins. And visibility was increased by 68%. Uh, this wasn't with adding additional ventilation. Um, trying to come up with some way to, you know, positive pressure or blow the smoke away. And just using the agent and spraying it through the smoke column was able to improve the visibility by reducing the carcinogens in the smoke. And again, we want to talk about just some of the, excuse me, the toxins and in the, in the um, carcinogens that were able to be reduced by that 98.6%. And again, that was with toluene. So, you know, we do have some other reports. Uh, one recently comes to us from a Laval Fire Department where they tested on structure fires, structural fires, and they saw, you know, anywhere from a 60 to a 90 percent, <coughs> excuse me, reduction in the soot and the toxins and the carcinogens that firefighters are exposed to in those types of fires. But now we get into, and let's talk more again about those hazards that uh, are going to come to us uh, from burning lithium ion batteries. And first, we've talked about it, how it's eco-friendly, the F500. 
how it's non corrosive biodegradable. There's no PFAS. And when we look at, again, these some of these reports that are coming to us, this is the gel lab that did the testing for the different fluoridated ingredients. And I said at the beginning, this product has been around since 1997. And we began in 2003 to make certain that uh, we, as a company, had no fluoridated um, chemicals within our uh, area, within our company. The testing that I'm going to be talking about, and I said earlier, uh, we're going to basically go over some of the testing, third-party testing. Uh, it's been done uh, starting back in 2008 with Bosch, and it's covered in the uh, NFPA 18A Annex 4.3. I, I mentioned, and we'll talk more about it. One of the other things I want to talk about is this NEN NTA 8133 test. Um, so, again, you know, around the world, um, there is testing that is constantly taking place. People looking for a solution that works on being able to deal with these fires in all the different applications. Um, and, again, as we talked about, I mentioned that parking structure earlier. Um, we're going to see some, hopefully, some reports that are coming out here shortly um, that are going to address those types of fires. Uh, we've got a test that uh, very promising, uh, great information, and, and again, unfortunately, not able to, to share that on this particular one, but uh, looking forward to in the next. We look at this test that was done, and here is a test that uh, has, you know, a, a battery pack uh, that's inside of a Connex box. It's a 20-foot Connex box, just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of what's taking place here are some tests. Um, inside the Connex box, uh, as you see here, they've got the battery that they're putting into thermal runaway, uh, leading to the thermal propagation. Um, in the Connex box, they've set up two pendant style sprinkler heads. And because they're wanting to test the effectiveness of the agent in a sprinkler system, they're going to allow this battery to burn until it gets or builds up enough heat to activate those sprinkler heads. So I'll go ahead and speed it up just a little bit for you so we don't have to sit here. But uh, I caution um, that uh, you kind of look away. Uh, you may miss it. But we'll watch um, and we'll see just how effective that the agent is. And we just heard from the other test within seven seconds with a fire extinguisher. Look how quickly the flames were able to be extinguished with the F500 independent style sprinkler heads type of uh, you would have inside of a structure or a building. Now, almost instantly, the flames are extinguished. <clears throat> it's having an effect on the atmosphere, the gases that are being released. We're having an ability to encapsulate and reduce some of those toxins that uh, were being released when that battery is burning. And... Again, as they continue to allow that system to spray down on the battery, it's going to start encapsulating those electrolytes. And it's going to reduce the ability of those electrolytes to be reignited by the stranded energy that we hear about that's in these batteries. That happens hours, days, and possibly weeks later when we use water. You know, the water may evaporate away that flammable electrolyte is still in there. And if there's a, a spark from some of that stranded energy, you have a fuel source when you use plain water. You use an encapsulator agent, we're encapsulating that flammable electrolyte, that fuel source is, is gone. Okay, when the uh, encapsulator evaporates away, it takes the electrolyte with it. So now I mentioned um, the Annex 4.3 material here a couple of times. Um, I mentioned how uh, Bosch uh, was one of the was the first, but you know we've seen the reports from the Fraunhofer, uh, some Kiwa Labs, the Daker, the Daimler, the Deutsch. Uh, there's there's a long list of chronology of all the testing that's been done. And while you know we look at this, this was updated in 2022. It's only been a year, and the list has grown as far as the number of tests. And as you saw from the one professor making the comment that, you know, hey, he had prejudged. Again, it continues. All of the different testing that's being done, all the people that 
used to have no experience in seeing this product work on being able to deal with these types of hazards are starting to sit there and test it and finding out that, oh, hey, this has got some possibilities. This is really, really good. This can put the fires out. You know, we don't need 15,000 gallons of water. There's always water. something in there. So it makes a huge difference. And now I'm going to get into, uh, I guess, like one of my pet peeves because we talked about how um, in our buildings, you know, we uh, aren't doing anything to to try to address the hazard. You know, we are still with our ABC extinguishers. And you know what? Again, we're not the only country um, that's dealing with the lithium ion battery hazard. You know, that's why we have on this webinar people from around the world, you know, trying to learn how to deal with these. And let's look at the Dutch. Uh, the Dutch understood that, you know, we have to do something, so they created a test. It's the NEN NTA8133 test. And they designed this because they were looking for a listing that they could give a fire extinguisher that had the ability to extinguish up to a 600-watt-hour battery. So they came up with a test pro a parameter um, and some guidelines that they were hoping to and if, you know, extinguishers could be able to pass this test, um, you could get a actual listing for your extinguisher for up to a 600 watt hour battery. So as we looked, what they did is they set up this rack with batteries. And uh, in this one, it's, you know, showing you here that uh, they've got six 100 amp hour batteries that they all sandwiched like side by side. And as they go through, they will sit there and they will send these batteries into the thermal runaway propagation. Uh, they then go and extinguish these cells, these batteries. Once they're extinguished, they set for 20 minutes. There can be no reignition. They then go and they test to make certain that there's still voltage on some of the batteries. Because they don't want it to be a test where, you know, all these batteries burned up. And, you know, they don't know whether you extinguish it or, again, they just they just burn themselves out and there was nothing left. So they test to make sure there's still voltage on some of the batteries. And if you're able to extinguish and still have the uh, voltage on the batteries showing that you extinguish the batteries and you stop that thermal runaway from thermal propagation, you get a listing for an extinguisher. And it has that EN listing um, for up to that 600 watt hour battery. So needless to say, uh, in parts of the world, there are extinguishers that do carry a listing using F500 for those batteries. Now, when I was going over those Connex boxes with the lithium ion batteries, um, there was a similar incident that happened in Beijing um, and it led to this report. There's actually two reports, but I'm going to talk about the second report because, again, when we listened to the professor, the professor was talking about the F500, and he mentioned the promising aspects or the promise of uh, how effective water mist was. And, well, it just so happens that we've got a report here that does a comparison between F500 and that water mist that he was talking about. Um, and this was after the Beijing and, and China did a test like Bosch on all the different gases and all the different agents, the foams, the gels, the powders, inerting gases, and, and F500. And because of the promises and how effective the F500 was, it now was tested against okay, the um, F500 and water mist. And that's where this report comes from. And, you know, there is the full report that will be shared. And as we talk about and, you know, as we discussed throughout this presentation, um, if there's any of the reports that uh, we've talked about and uh, aren't included, by all means, you know, please contact us. We'll be more than happy to share um, these reports with you. But again, getting back to the Beijing instance in April of 2021, the explosion there on that battery energy storage system with the lithium ion phosphate type batteries, uh, on a roof with the solar panels, it killed two firefighters and injured one. So they weren't as fortunate as here in the United States with surprise. 
So for that reason, again, as I said, it led them to doing this testing to find a solution and see how they could deal with these types of fires. And one of the things from their testing that they found was one of the main gases that was being released when these lithium ion batteries burned was hydrogen, almost 70%. We're creating an explosive atmosphere, and I don't know if any of you are, you know, following some of the different, you know, posts and blogs on lithium-ion batteries, but you may have seen one where, you know, you've got the firefighters and you watch the garage door get blown off because of a, a vehicle uh, that was inside of it because of the, the basically the explosive gases. Right there, right there, the hydrogen. Just now it's just waiting for that right air fuel mixture. We get it there and we have the explosion. And that's what happened in Surprise, Arizona. That's what happened in China. Okay. It just, we had that explosive gas. We opened up the doors. We get that perfect air fuel mixture. We have the heat because of the batteries. And now we have that explosion, that huge explosion that injures and kills. Well, when they were doing this testing, again, comparison, water mist, very promising, as that one professor said in the F500. This test showed that when the lithium ion battery was burning at their peak, they were getting 476 parts per million. When water mist was used, it had a significant drop. It dropped it down to 217 parts per million. But then we added F500 into the water. And we dropped that hydrogen down to 14 parts per million. We almost eliminated that hazard, that explosive gas from that battery fire and it's not just the hydrogen we're having an effect on the hf the hydrofluoric okay it goes in in this report it starts talking about all the things that we've covered through the report how we're able to have an effect on encapsulating the fuel not just the hydrogen but the liquid and flammable the electrolytes it talks about the thermal runaway how we're able to have an effect on being able to cool rapidly and stop that propagation from continuing on, that batteries being affected and, and stopping that flame front. Again, one professor said seven seconds. He was able to stop that fire and start having an effect on extinguishing and, and putting that fire out. And again, all the different things that were covered in this report. We look at some testing that was done when it talks to, uh, again, the hazardous measuring the, the hazardous wastewater. Many people say, hey, you know, we're going to just use, you know, copious amounts of water and, you know, we're just going to let it run off. But where's it going to run off to? Is it going to run off into a pond or a stream? Does a community use that pond or stream for their drinking water? Is it going to have an effect on wells? You know, when we had just allowed that water to run off? You might think, hey, you know, we're diluting it, but hey, are we really diluting it to a point where if it gets into a static area and it gets back and starts accumulating, it's not going to have an effect on the environment? So when we sit there, we started looking, you know, some TL Clostal, again, some testing that was done from one of the groups through our uh, European office in conjunction with Johns Controls doing a lot of this third party testing. You know, they were looking at some of the the hazards and it went from when plain water was used this water runoff had to be uh, treated at a hazardous waste water treatment facility but when they started using the f500 solution on um, putting these fires out these battery fires out they found that it reduced the toxicity and the hazard to a point where now instead of having to pay huge amounts of money to have this specially treated and, and disposed of at this hazardous wastewater treatment facility. It could now be diluted down and treated in a municipal wastewater treatment facility. The properties and the hazards were greatly reduced when they used an F500 to extinguish. So, you know, this technology is, you know, protecting it's, it's, it's in uh, many of the leaders in the industry. When we look at, um, the lithium ion batteries and the manufacturers that are utilizing this technology. Now, here's just a list that of, of people that in some way are using us you know, to protect their battery abuse labs, uh, to protect their facilities where they construct and make batteries. 
And, you know, we're even getting into facilities that are recycling or trying to uh, get rid of the batteries once they've extended or been been used up and are no longer uh, able to hold a charge and need to need to be disposed of. So we are working on all of these different things. And when I mentioned uh, the ability of us to help with engineered systems in these facilities and our manufacturing and our uh, buildings, our warehouses, our distribution centers, our schools, any place where there's a sprinkler system where we have a concern about lithium ion batteries or pretty much any type of fire. Again, think about Bosch, you know, instead of five or six extinguishers on a wall, it's one, one agent, all fires. Well, guess what? Same with our buildings. You know, we hear, you know, these large distribution centers that are catching on fire and burning to the ground. The sprinkler systems are overwhelmed. They can't keep up. Um, and so we have multi-million dollar losses and disruptions in, in, in the food chains or some of whatever it might be that is stored in these distribution centers. Or by simply adding a water-driven proportioner into an existing sprinkler system, we can have a huge impact. And again, let's think about that Clemson report. Improved visibility, reduction in heat, no steam. Well, how many times do you hear about firefighters or people getting disorientated because of the st thick smoke that's being generated in these fires, especially in some of these large buildings? We can have an effect. Okay, this technology, and here's an example of a water trim proportioner um, with some, some totes that hold the concentrate, gravity-fed, um, these work uh, very well uh, in a wide range of flows. It's it's unlike you know some of the other systems where uh, you know you you design them and they are only limited as to how many sprinklers um, that are being activated. With the water driven proportioner, it covers a much wider range of flows. Talk about the battery energy storage system and grid protection. Many facilities, power companies are utilizing this technology already to protect transformers, protect an under turbine lube oil, and to protect various parts of their power plants and transformers. Uh, history showing that uh, a transformer that had caught on fire at one facility, the protected by F500, fire went off, activated the sprinkler system, once the system was activated, within three minutes and 10 seconds, the fire was extinguished. There was no human intervention, no need for the fire department. Everything was contained. Okay, The cost of cleanup and getting them back in operation was a matter of a week, a couple of weeks. Okay, Very little downtime. And again, little downtime means you're back up and making money. You're operational. Yet, in a similar incident at a sister facility where F500 wasn't protecting it, they used foam, and needless to say, because of the fact that the foam was unable to work, the fire departments worked for five hours trying to extinguish the fire using fluoridated foams, causing a multi-million dollar cleanup. So instead of you know a, a matter of weeks, now you're talking months to be able to do the cleanup. Well, how much money was lost, not just in the cost of the cleanup, but the downtime? You know, week, two weeks versus months. Uh, I, I mean, there's there's a lot of downtime. So again, you know, when we sit there and start looking at the cost of fire protection and these types of things, is even lithium ion battery where we're storing them. Huge, huge benefit when we sit there and start looking at utilizing this technology. Again, it works on all the different hazards. You know, so let's start looking at how F500 and HCT can work with you to help give you some training and talk to you about the hazards, help you with planning, equipment, and training that you might need. You know, fire department, industry, we're here to hopefully help you understand these hazards and how we can, I guess, benefit and help you to make things safer. Okay, when we look at mobile equipment, again, how are these, you know, how is this equipment being charged? I know when we start looking at some of these fleets, these buses, you know, they're parked relatively close together. Okay, and let's think of some of those videos we see, those jetting flames. How are you, you going to be able to deal with those, especially if there's no suppression system around? You know, you could end up having one failure and taking out a series of buses or a series of cars 
because there's no method of being able to deal with that hazard at some of these facilities where they're putting these in. And, you know, I, I jokingly talk about, you know, we, we I mentioned how that one e-mobility device was in that room um, and uh, caught on fire next, not far from the doorway. But in sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm traveling and I'm going into some of these different parking garages and structures and things like that. I kind of uh, get a, a jokingly talk to people and mention how these people that have um, battery powered cars, EVs get preferential parking and where's that preferential parking at it's, it's usually close to the exits it's like hmm my oh my um you know we hear about the hazards and how dangerous these batteries are but yet we're placing them in areas of egress of how we're going to be able to get away so some of the areas where we can again work with you and talk to you about is is the equipment not only with the diamond dosers and the training and things like that but you know we've got extinguishers the two and a half gallon the nine liter or, or the quamus the quick attack mobile units basically some people call them a trolley unit because of the wheels um, they come in various sizes uh, we got nozzles specialized nozzles carts uh, trailers that hold concentrate up to, i think we have some that are 500 gallons and, and thermal imagers thermal imager is going to be one of your best friends uh, when you're dealing with these lithium ion batteries, and as you saw uh, with that one video with that we were showing the car fire and the temperatures, how it showed that drastic reduction in temperature. When you're dealing with these fires, the lithium ion batteries, to be able to make certain that those temperatures are continuing to fall, that you've stopped the propagation, is going to be using that thermal imaging camera. So just in a quick summary, you know, we've talked about, you know, all of these different hazards, these batteries, battery energy storage systems or vehicles. I hope I've given you a little bit better understanding of how effective the encapsulator agent is in being able to deal with this growing hazard that we have, being able to extinguish the fire, stopping that propagation, stopping the thermal runaway. And in closing, I would just like to say that, you know, here we have our contact information. By all means, you know, please feel free to contact us with any questions. We're going to open up the mic here now. Um, and feel free to ask your questions. Um, if uh, I mentioned earlier, there's reports or things that you would like to see that uh, when with this is, uh, presentation or this webinar is shared with you um, in an email, contact us. Let us know. Don't go away with questions. We're here to answer the questions and hopefully give you a better understanding of how this technology can deal with the growing hazard that we're facing. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day, your evening, morning, wherever you may be for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure.